All right. All right, ladies, I think we're going to get started. But you got you ladies keep eating. Now I don't know, do I say you guys, you ladies, what do I say? <laughs> All right, well, welcome everybody. I think most of you in the, the room know me. I'm Shay, Shay Snowden. I'll give a thank you. Financial advisor at the Life Wealth Group and with all of us are all the other women of the Life Wealth Group in here. So we have a few new faces you may not have met, but you all know Michelle, you know your niece, you know Susan and Joella, but have you met Megan? So everybody say hello, that's Megan. Megan. New, she's new in our office and so is Chelsea. So we are expanding, so thank you everybody. So do appreciate you coming out this wonderful lunch time. So for those of you who do not know, I'm a financial advisor with the Life Wealth Group. We are here to educate women on finances and there's a very good reason why we do that. But today, you're not just gonna hear about finances and financial health and investing. You're gonna, we're gonna have got a special guest with us. Dana's gonna be speaking us, to us in a little while, but it's gonna be more about mental health. So we're gonna tie in the link between financial health and mental health in just a few moments with you. We also have another special guest with us. Diane is in the back corner there. She is gonna give you all a free massage because the reality is we've gotta have our bodies, our minds, all in line with our, as all part of our well-being. Is that right? So we're gonna cover the whole, the holistic picture today. So glad you're here for that. I'm gonna get this right in just a minute. <laughs> All right, what am I doing wrong? Am I going the wrong way? I was going the wrong way. All right, so we are the women of From Wonder to Wisdom, and the reason we chose that title to name us is, have you ever had questions? I wonder this, I wonder that. Well, we wanna get the questions answered for you. So this is part of why we bring financial wisdom and financial savviness to you. But a quick recap of how we got started. <laughs> I think women have come a long way. We've evolved. Wasn't that long ago, you couldn't even as a woman get a credit card unless you had your father or your husband with you. Don't know if anybody in the room remembers those days, but it used to be that way. Right now, women are controlling over more than, more than five trillion in wealth. It's projected that women will control over 30 trillion in wealth by, the by about 2030. That means the load is on you. And we, those of you who are regulars know this, as you've um, gone through your careers, you've had to begin to make financial decisions where typically it was the man that did it. You're either living longer than, or now living your husband's and so you find yourself later in life becoming more involved with the finances. Whether it's divorce, widowhood or singlehood in some way, shape or form, women are finding themselves more involved in the decision-making process, however, still feeling not as confident as they would like to feel. The men tend to be a bit more confident, but women seem to lack that. So our purpose is to bridge that gap between your confidence level and your responsibilities so you can take on your responsibilities in a very educated, strong way. Okay, so that's how we got started. The plan was to do that through elevating, empowering, and encouraging one another. The encouragement is the being together. The empowering is the knowledge, and the elevation is just when you feel that you're equipping yourself with the information you need, you feel more in control in life. And that's our hope that we can achieve that with you. We're gonna do it through these sessions, giving you more and more information and engaging together during this time. As I said, we want to make it not just financial health, but we wanna make it your physical health and your mental health as well. And there's a very important reason for that. I mean, we are, a, <laughs> when I say Bob, I remember the picture of the Jack Daniels? When would you ever see a female given a whiskey? I don't think it was Jack Daniels, it was something. <laughs> Jimmy Beans. But who would have ever thought associated a woman being able to advertise uh, 
being selected for an advertisement for a whiskey. But we're still evolving, we're still growing, we're still, um, we're still coming into our role and evolving into it. So we just wanna keep on growing through our education, through our engagement, we're gonna elevate one another. We wanna become exceptional and empowered sab e women. I'm playing on that E. <laughs> right there. So I like to call us Savvy Women because Savvy's got a wonderful meaning. I love the women of uh, Savvy. Its definition is a shrewdness and knowledgeable, having common sense and good judgment. When you are shrewd, knowledgeable, educated, and you know how to apply wisdom and good decision making to that information, then you do well in life. It's not all about accumulating, accumulating, and accumulating wealth. You also have to accumulate knowledge, and with that knowledge, you have to know how to apply it too, and that would be the wisdom side. So a savvy woman is able to do all of that, gain the knowledge and know how to use it. So, but, Part of being able to use sound judgment is going to connect right into your mental health. So that's where the link comes in for our guest speaker and our topic today. If you are not able to function because you're under a cloud emotionally, you're not going to make good decisions whether it's financial decisions or other decisions, it's gonna to be tough to make those decisions. How many of you, when you've even been in pain in your physical bodies, if you're not doing well in your physical bodies and you are experiencing pain, how many of you notice that pain steals your focus, doesn't it? You're not good with your relationships, you're not good with your decision making, you're not good concentrating on your day-to-day -day activities. So physical well-being, and emotional and mental well-being is very linked together. And part of being that savvy, good judgment, common sense woman that we want to be and need to be because of our responsibilities is gonna have a lot to do with our mental health on a day-to-day -day basis. How many of you have been through times of darkness or depression? Yeah, probably all of us in the room at some point. I may have met one or two people in my entire lifetime who proclaim that I'm just born happy and positive. <laughs> I've met, I have met those people, maybe one or two in my entire life. Don't know if I believe them or not, but that's what they say. And they always come across upbeat and positive. But the rest of us, we have our ups, we have our downs, we have our good days and our bad days. I don't know about you, but I've learned as I've gotten older to recognize the triggers that are taking me on a certain road and like, uh oh. I don't want to go down that road. I remember I have to turn around and get myself off. So good, good emotional and mental health is knowing your triggers and being able to come off it. But I'm going to leave it for the next person to talk about that. That's just my personal what I watch. So we want to be able to make those good decisions. But before we move on to that, a couple of things, a couple of announcements for you. We have our next Wine and Wisdom coming up on July the 13th at 6 p.m. We're doing it at a beautiful venue. I'm gonna show you it in just a moment. And also the next event that we are doing here is gonna be on September the 7th um, at 12 noon again, just like today, but it's September the 7th, okay? So we do it the first um, Thursday in the month. So that's the next one. Uh, it's quarterly meeting, like-minded ladies like ourselves and lunch and wine and whatever else. And occasionally you get a massage too, so. <laughs> Please make sure you save the date on that. I want to bring up another one of our special Life Wealth Group ladies, um, Yanice, if you would like to join me for a moment. Yanice, for all of you who don't know, but I'm sure you do know most of you, but just in case there's one of you who don't, Yanice and her husband, Hilgott, are the original founders of this company many years ago. So she is co founder and co-owner of the Life Wealth Group. And Eunice is going to introduce our special guest speaker today. So thank you, everybody. Eunice, you want to go ahead? Well, first of all, I want to just say thank you for coming and welcome. And it's such a pleasure to see and think where we started with this group. I think we were 10 or 15 ladies. And this turned out that soon we will either have to start separating tables or something. It's just, it's, it's great to be there. But I also wanted to say without any further ado, it's such a pleasure and an honor today to introduce a, not just a good friend of mine, uh, Dana West, but somebody that I really respect in the community for quite a few reasons. 
not just only is she a licensed clinical social worker, she is a licensed um, mental health provider, but like in my case, she is also a co-owner of a company, and she co-owns that company, Total Life Counseling, with her husband. And believe me, that's a challenge. <laughs> Not her husband, but, but being in business with your husband is a challenge. That is a mental challenge. <laughs> and uh, you know what? I know whenever I speak with Dana, I get sound advice. Um, not just from a counseling perspective, but as a friend. Um, she is not just juggling co of uh, business, she also has two kids, um, little Mia and Jimmy. Um, so she's, she's kind of playing that double, uh, double duty of work and, and having kids. Uh, Dana, in her profession, she's very involved. I know um, um, usually at the church or even um, with different associations, but she also focuses in her practice on um, sexual ab abuse, marriage counseling, and addictions. That is her focus, although um, I know for a fact uh, she, ch she speaks to her clients holistically. But Dana, it's such a pleasure that you can be here for us, and uh, please give her a hand. Unique um, is such a dear friend, and honestly, I met her in a small group, spiritually, with women, and just having a sort of power and courage and love on one another, and be authentic and real, as well as based on truth, biblical truth. So it's, it's just a blessing to do that Bible study with her for five years. But yeah, so I'm Dana. I have been a mental health counselor for over 18 years. Me and my husband both own Toilet Counseling Center. In the Orlando area, we have five different locations and 20 therapists on staff that all specialize in the area that they have their expertise or passion about. Um, we truly believe to be a mental health professional, we're not generalists. A lot of people know a little bit of everything in mental health, but what we have found the most effective is people specializing in one area and treating those um, clients and individuals that need that specific help. So in my career, I've changed a lot through the years. So the first few years when I was counseling, I was in a dual diagnosis treatment center, which was severe mental health with addiction. And I believe it was the best training of my life because I got to see pretty much everything. It was really like being in an inpatient hospital but not that extreme. People were in that deep crisis, but they usually would come from those settings and come into our setting. And it was such a blessing to work at this treatment center for nine years I was a part of it because I saw miracles every day. You know, we would see people transform. I'm really passionate about substance abuse and addiction recovery because people change. What I always used to tell people is you would see someone come in and they look dark and kind of like demonic. I would think, how is this person going to be? Who is this person? And a week to a month of recovery, you would see this beautiful spirit and soul that was just like me and you. They just learned a way to cope with their mental health issue and usually trauma <coughs> through unhealthy coping, which is just drinking and using substances. And so throughout the, those years, honestly, I would say it was the best part of my career because most of those people who did recover, they're therapists now too, 10, 15 years sober. It was amazing. Um, but part of my personal story is one reason I believe I was called to be a mental health counselor is I'm also a sexual abuse survivor. And it changed my life um, dramatically, and I lived a double life. Like, people would know I was a... AB student, I was involved in drama and plays and theater, and nobody really knew I was suffering and dying inside. And I honestly had my own mental health issues, clearly. I had post-traumatic stress, I had used substances to deal with it, and I had depression and anxiety. And I went to school, and I remember going to school and getting my master's, and they were basically saying that sexual abuse survivors don't really get better. They were trying to say that long term, and this was in the early 2000s, things have changed dramatically, thank God, and for women, for mental health. And that really um, 
was really a negative thing for my life. And so after that, I found a ministry that was a sexual abuse recovery ministry, and it changed my life and transformed. And I would say my issues with eating disorders, depression, anxiety, subside. Um, doesn't mean I don't have episodes from time to time. That's what happens with mental health. Sometimes there are relapses. But uh, that was my passion. And for 10 years, I was involved in leadership for sexual abuse recovery. So if any of you are a survivor, because honestly, um, one out of three women will have at least one event that happens in childhood or adulthood that's rape or sexual assault in any manner. And I truly have a heart and a passion for everyone to have a voice to that event and to get help and, and recover it from that. That's a whole other side note. But so then after that, I met my husband. We've been married for 10 years. He owned Total Life Counseling prior. So I just felt like God just brought us together and aligned us. And being in business, as he said, um, it has its strengths and complications. But I would say we're a perfect match in that way. Like when I went to the table, he brings the office. So it's, it's been a really big blessing. And so now I really specialize, as she said, in marriage counseling, addiction, codependency, um, trauma, depression, and anxiety. So when Minnie's asked me to speak on mental wellness, there's so much I could share. So I figured I'm just going to do tips. I was going to think of things that you guys could take home today and to help with your own mental health. So um, I do have handouts that will pass out, and I'm going to kind of go over them, and there are things you can do on your own at home. But just with women in general, women, one out of three women will definitely go through some type of mental health. Um, will have some form of mental health and usually it's depression and anxiety. And I think as women, if we've been told to have it all, we have to do it all, right? Be the perfect mother, wife, have a career, do all that, that pressure is intense. And we can pull that together. We can't do that all the time. And I think as women, sometimes if we're isolated, not talking about those pressures, that's where depression and anxiety really come in. So, um, I'm very passionate that everyone needs tools and tips and that we're not alone. I mean, we're not alone. And what I really believe we were designed to do, we're designed to be in community and to share our real experiences with others and our families and our thoughts and get that support. So I'm just going to share with you things that I have personally done in my own life, things I teach my clients, things that are research-based and um, really do approve depression and anxiety in particular. So I'm going to keep it on those two topics. And so one of the big ones is called mindfulness. So a lot of times in life, we're super busy, right? We you know, run households, jobs, take care of our kids, grandkids, whoever it may be, husbands, all of that. And we forget about ourselves, right? There's always a list that's insane. And it's like, I have to get this list done. I can't take that time. I truly believe that's when our mental health deteriorates is when we forget about ourselves. You know, you've heard that expression on the airlines, we have to put that mask, that oxygen mask first on ourselves before we can put it on a minor or a child. You know, that applies in all situations for women. Doesn't matter what role we play, there's so many hats. Um, so this is one thing that you could do, and I hope you all are doing it, which is basically mindfulness. I know for me, if I just slow down, and I like to do this every morning. It's like part of my morning routine. I discovered it in my own recovery process, and then when I became a mother the first time, I would get up an hour earlier because I needed that quiet time of just being with me, with God, focusing just on things I was grateful for and what I needed to do that day. It was really my like, life support. So mindfulness is basically just enjoying the moment. And because of the new digital age and cell phones, like we're constantly connected. And I believe, of course, it's a positive that we can reach anyone at any time, but there's really negative impacts to that. I mean, I miss the days that you could leave your house and no one could reach you. You were unreachable. You remember? The, I mean, that was actually glorious. I would think back then, I was definitely younger during those times, but I really truly miss that. I don't like being connected to this device. And so one thing I've learned is, you know, my mental health and most people's mental health is impacted by being connected to this device. And I can only imagine the research that will come out in the future, really how that affects our brains, 
and really how it's affecting our children and adolescents is terrible. Mm -hmm. I would say that um, for women, for adolescent girls from the ages of 13 to 17, self-mutilation and suicide, suicide attempts went up 250% mm -hmm. since 2010. And the direct link is really, they think, uh, social media and just the effects of that. So one part of mindfulness is being in nature and really being in the present moment, moment and focusing on our five senses. So one of my favorite things to do is to sit outside and listen in the morning for the birds, smell if it rained, you know, it has a different type of smell, or when you wake up in the morning, um, just focusing on what's in front of you and really practicing not really thinking about anything else. I think there's nothing that brings me personally more joy than connecting in nature. And forgetting about my responsibilities, my to-do list, my mother, my clients, husband, grocery, you know, whatever I needed to do. That those moments recharge me more than anything. And I truly believe as women we need to do that for a full day, really, once a week. <laughs> if we could just forget about the responsibilities of life and just connect with our you know, God, our higher power, nature, and family that really matters, and don't worry about all the rest of stressors that are in our lives. So that's one way. But another thing to do with mindfulness is recognizing how we're feeling mentally and emotionally. A lot of times people think, I can't meditate, I can't sit quietly without having, like, that, you know, as women, we have so many more thoughts than men. It's crazy. I don't know the exact number, but it's like at least 60% more than men have in one day. So we always constantly have something going. So it's such a skill to learn how to quiet your mind. And I believe I do it best in nature. I just feel like if I'm in my house, there's always something that can distract me. But in nature, I just feel this sense of peace. And I feel some, I feel God. And it's just, I feel like I'm connected to something greater. So um, it's so important to do that and slow down. And yoga and meditation is really a good practice to learn. And I'm kind of going to bring up someone that I, I love. There's a woman named Angie Wynn, and she owns the loft on Main in downtown Vandermeer, and she does this thing called yin yoga, which is not the traditional yoga where it's like an intense workout, it's really slow and mindful and stretching, and she teaches you how to quiet your mind. But there's also many apps and other things you could do to do guided meditation. That's one of my favorite tools for therapy, especially for women is teaching them how to do that mindfulness and the deep breathing. Because anxiety, what they say, the number one thing to treat anxiety is to just catch your breath. And a lot of people are like, that's not, that's not helpful. I don't know how to do that. And so I've had one time where someone had a panic attack in my office, and I had to breathe with them for 10 minutes. And after that, they went away. They were grounded, and they were able to focus and do what they needed to do. So that kind of practice is really important in our daily lives. And I encourage you, if you're interested, to look up, look up into that. But the one thing I'm going to talk really more about is focusing on our feelings and our thoughts. I think the world today, we're so distracted from our feelings, and there's so many things to know us. What I've learned from my personal experience with healing and working with others is if we slow down and actually recognize what we're feeling and express it in some way, it could be through journaling, prayer, calling a friend, a trusted person, it takes the really weight off. And so instead of keep going a mile a minute, it's learning to slow down. So one way I've taught, I used to teach this in the inpatient treatment center I worked for, but also in outpatient, and I, I personally do this, is part of my mindfulness practice is focusing on my feelings and thoughts. So the first thing I always do is gratitude. So I know you've heard this before, but honestly, when we first worked in this treatment center, it's, I had a bumper sticker like in my office that said, gratitude is the best therapy which truthfully it is. Because when you wake up and you think about all the things you have to do or all the things that are wrong with the world or all the problems we have that we can't fix and we're out of our control, we keep running that in our heads. How are we going to feel? Anxious, scared, depressed, down, just not happy with ourselves in the world. And so gratitude is the number one quick thing you can do to change things. 
So when I teach people who don't apply that, sometimes they go, I have nothing to be grateful for. There's always something. And you you fix you pick the big things. So it's like shelter, you know, water, food, I have you know money to pay my bills, great. But it goes even deeper. I think gratitude is finding these small little moments. Like sometimes for me it's like the wind in the air or like a song comes on that just reminds me of a time in my life that I felt so happy, or a call with a friend, or whatever it may be. So just starting your day out with that, just thinking and thanking God, like what you're grateful for. And then the other is feelings. So I think it's really important to check in your heart center and be like, what do I feel today? And so in the your packet, I have a feeling word vocabulary. And so um, the first time I saw this, most people who come in, because I work with a lot of trauma survivors, they don't know what they're feeling. Because what happens is when you are a trauma survivor and women, um, you know, there are probably 60% of the people who are trauma survivors in some form, which is some form. Because my definition of trauma is any um, any event that was less than nurturing. And I know that sounds crazy, and people are always like, what? like that can be everything, anything, but it's all individualized. Me and you can witness the same event, and I can be resilient and be fine, and you could be a mess, right? So it's really just your own individual experience. And as women and as people, we compare a lot. We, we don't need to compare. If we know something has affected us in a negative way, it's valid. There's always someone that's going to have a harder experience or you know less than. Like there's always greater and more. So we can't focus on that. We have to validate ourselves. So I just like this um, feeling word vocabulary because on the top, some people are like I don't know what I feel. I'm good. Like when people greet you, you say, "How are you doing?" I'm good. That's what we usually say. Oh, things are good. I would say 50% of the time, people are not telling you the real truth, <laughs> right? Because I don't like to say I'm good. I've learned to tell my truth. Sometimes I say, yeah, I'm struggling today, or you know, I'm a little down, or yeah, I'm feeling great. I feel like when people say that, that's more authentic. You know what they're saying? I'm great. Things are great. Um, but then you've heard this before too, when someone says, I'm fine. You know, the acronym that's just frightened, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> I know right away if I ask my husband or my best friend or someone, the person like, how are you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. And I'm, You're like the opposite of that. And so I try to always ask, well, how are you really feeling? And I think as a culture, we just skip through it. We skip through our feelings. So that's why I think mindfulness is doing like a journaling on your feelings. And I don't love writing, but honestly, journaling my feelings is so, it gives me life. It's just so purposeful that it's, it's like if I just write something out I'm anxious or scared about something, it takes it away. And so what I've learned too a lot is to share, to find a trusted people you can share your fears, your anger, your sadness with. And that takes it away for me. Sometimes I'm angry if I can just say something to someone, three minutes later I'm over it. Instead of letting it fester, and fester, and fester. <laughs> One of my favorite books from years ago is Pain Buried Alive Never Dies. So like that's what we try to do as humans, repress, deny, forget about it, but it's stored in our souls and our bodies and it comes out physically. That's usually why we have a lot of different types of physical problems, but definitely the back pain, stomach issues, um, tense muscles, things like that, even arthritis, I would say sometimes it's more like marrying and like you're kind of harboring those some feelings. So that's another mindfulness practice. Because of time, basically I also included what I teach a lot of people, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. I don't know if you've ever heard of it before, but it's the most research-based effective form of therapy for depression, anxiety, and addictions. So you know that expression, you are what you eat. So I know if I ate McDonald's for every meal for a week, how would you feel? Bloated, <laughs> terrible, sick, and I would gain 10 pounds. Like that's who I have Italian. Like, immediately gain weight. So I feel terrible. Well, we are what we think. Like if we're thinking negative, irrational, dark thoughts, we're going to feel anxious, sad, depressed, down. So um, I gave you a little thing in here that teaches you kind of how to do what I call thought blocks. So in my experience, when someone comes in with anxiety or depression, I tell them to do this. It's one of the first things we talk about 
and teaching them how to recognize their thoughts and slow down. Right? So what triggered this thought? What are you thinking? I'm so scared um, this, this, this is going to happen. And you try to find the evidence. Because nine out of ten times, there's really no real evidence for that irrational fear or thought that you're having. And so you challenge that thought. So behind here is the ten most common, we call cognitive distortions in mental health, but we call it stinking thinking. It's just stinking thinking. You know, we all have it. Every human being has some thoughts that are stinking. So it's just recognizing and catching them. And so in my experience, if someone comes in with anxiety or depression and they do these thought logs daily. So some days you might feel okay, you might not be more than one. That one day you might have 10. I just say you want to slow down and recognize what you're thinking and learn to challenge it. So the clients, when I was in the inpatient center, I would have them from three months to six months. So it was awesome. I got to see them real quickly. It was so rewarding. But you would see clients that suffered from severe anxiety disorders or depression, and then they would feel freedom and just joy by the end. Because what happens is we can fully rewire our brain in a year to year and a half if we actually do cognitive behavioral techniques. And so now I naturally, I mean, I get into a pit fall sometimes, of course, but I naturally can do it in my head. Like if I catch myself, you know, think of something obsessively negative, I'm like, oh, damn. Stop sign. I teach people there's a stop sign. Stop. What are you feeling? How can you reframe this? Is there evidence for it? And it's easy to just do it on your own. And research really shows we can do that. We, our synapses in our brain, these wired ways we think, can be died out by new ways of thought. So if we learn how to speak more positive and positive affirmations, they become stronger and the whole way of thinking goes away. And it's really effective. I'm all about self. I didn't bring, I didn't do this, but also affirmations, just saying something positive by yourself. Because I think it's when we suffer with self-esteem the most. For the body image, comparing, do we have enough, are we enough? And you all are enough, and I made mean, through the grace of God, I had that, but we are enough. We all have special gifts and talents, and that's enough. But it's just learning that and believing that. So we can fully re rewire our brain. Affirmations are proven to be effective in work. After, I would say, 60 days, you start actually believing some of that if you do it. And I love having a mirror in my office because any I've never had a single person not look in the mirror and look in their eyes because that's our soul. That's how we really connect with our heart. And I say, look at yourself and say something like if it's positive, unworthy of love, you know, whatever it may be. Everyone boo-boos and sobs. Because I think we don't actually slow down and like connect with that part of us. And um, it's just really healing to actually do that and look and start saying positive things and speaking life and truth over ourselves. And so these are just things you can all do on your own, just part of everyday activities that take 10 to 15 minutes to do. So that's like another one. But then back here, I just included challenging thoughts. So sometimes when people are like, I believe it's true. So you don't know how to reframe a thought. So these are questions you can ask yourself um, to help you challenge a thought. So like sometimes one of the best things I like to say to someone is, would you say that to your best friend or your daughter? Like, I'm stupid, I'm never going to make good decisions. We say the meanest things to ourselves, especially women. Would we actually say that to a friend, uh, a child, somebody else? No. So one of the best questions I like to ask is, would you? What would your best friend say? What would you? Whoever the most supportive person would they call you stupid, and that you can never get your life together, or whatever it may be? They'd be like, no. So that's like one way to look at it. But there's all these different ways to challenge it. I know I'm going through it fast, but. I just wanted to give little tips and little things for you to have that you can look at later and kind of look into you to kind of develop it part of your practice. Um, but that's really what I do for mindfulness. And then I just wanted to share another holistic approach that we do, especially at Total Life Counseling Center. Um, I'm definitely a supporter of medication, but my husband, who's the president of the company, really believes in alternatives. So there's this mind-body connection. And so I just wanted to really talk about how we can 
have serotonin be built in our bodies through diet and supplements because serotonin is one of the main reasons we have depression or anxiety or irrational thoughts or thinking. And so sometimes our body doesn't naturally produce it, and that's why medication is there. It's kind of one of these things that just does it on its own. But there's a lot of negative side effects sometimes for people with medication. So um, these are some things that you can do. So serotonin helps with us to have emotional stability and with our sleep and our appetite, as well as helps with our mood swings and OCD and all of that. And then basically how we can build serotonin is through L-tryptophan, through food, as well as through calcium and magnesium. These are things that our body naturally needs. So I just was sharing, um, this is part of my husband's stress less series. Everyone at Total Life is trained in this. The first to do the alternatives to medication if someone's interested, because um, again, I'm supportive of medication. If someone wants to go that out, that's fine. But most people are afraid of medication. And I would say through the 25 years my husband's been doing this, and the 11 since I've known about it, 60 to 70 percent of individuals, men or women, this is effective enough. Their mood mm -hmm. actually changes with therapy. Some of the tips and tools that I kind of talked about, and if you have other relationship issues or trauma, you have to address that too. So these are um, foods that are natural where you can build serotonin, and it's basically all whole foods, right? Not processed sugar, refined sugar. You know, we kind of learn that. <laughs> You know, through the years, but these are things that you can focus on and then trip a trip And so, basically, one thing my husband discovered, I would say 10 years ago, is not all, but most vegetarians sometimes can suffer from depression and anxiety because they don't eat meat. That's why we have tryptophan that actually naturally stays in our body for longer periods of time. So, he um, came up with this plan that they have to eat more frequently because there is foods that vegetarians can eat that provide that, but it doesn't stay, it digests too fast. So one to two hours later, it's depleted. So these are some of other things that you can do and other foods you can eat. And then the last page, I just brought the one for anxiety. So these are alternatives to medication. And anxiety and depression, I think they're exactly the same, honestly. But um, the top is for children because my husband specializes with ADD and autistic spectrum children in particular. So you'll see things that children and teens can take. But the bottom is for adults. So just, you know, quickly, basically a canine. I can't say anything more positive about the supplement of canine. Um, it's amino acid, and extract, and it's a natural, like, it has this natural calming effect. So it, should, it does two things. Honestly, it treats ADD, which mm -hmm. I think is kind of crazy. There's seven forms of ADD, so it doesn't help to every form, but there's certain ones it will. It does a focused relaxation. And then for people with true anxiety, it calms the brain. It takes the edge off. It's not like a benzodiazepine like Xanax or Ativan where like, your brain just, yeah, exactly, shuts off immediately. It just kind of takes the edge off. And so personally, after my Second baby, I have postpartum anxiety. It was so extreme. And I started taking it. And it didn't work right away, but after time, when my son started sleeping, you know, I felt so much better. But now I take it. I used to wake up five to six times a night. I take it at night. I take two a night, and I fall asleep. And I might wake up once to go to the bathroom, and sometimes twice. Like, I truly believe in LTA9, and I've seen so many people benefit from it, especially the week before periods with post, you know, hormones is one you know, the main reason I think women have more anxiety and depression as well. All the different hormonal changes from when you're 13 to menopause, right? I mean, it's just a constant flux of changes, but that helps with that, even taking it the week before your period. Um, but I just couldn't say enough good things about it, and honestly, if you research it, you will not find a single mm -hmm. negative thing about it. And I always talk about it with physicians <coughs> and ask questions, and they start recommending it to their clients if they think they don't find anything negative. So I just recommend it. Can't say more. And then also DHA, which of course, you know, is good for us, for our body and brain. And then magnesium and calcium. So this also helps with calming and positive thoughts. 
and it builds those neurotransmitters to provide serotonin. Mm -hmm. And so these are the recommended dosages. And um, sometimes if you eat a healthy diet, you don't need as much magnesium as they say. You could not, it comes out of diarrhea or something. But if that happens to you, that means you're eating your vegetables <laughs> and you're getting it naturally, and you're getting calcium and all that. So, um, yeah. So this is kind of just an alternative to medication, and this is something that we're just passionate about at TLC for ADD, anxiety, depression. My husband even says for bipolar disorder, I would say type two, type one, not necessarily, but that's a whole other conversation. But yeah, so I just wanted to share with you just a couple of tips and tools that you can take home to kind of just focus on your mental health and put in yourself first. And just taking that break and that time out. I know that I can find a million reasons not to do it, and my day doesn't go as well. Honestly, I get frustrated and annoyed. I might say something I don't want to say. Every time I ground myself and take that time for me, it's life changing. So, um, I mean, I can talk for us, but I know it's <laughs> time. <laughs> but thank you for having me. And, yeah. thank All right. You. Thank you. Years ago, they allowed uh, studies to be done on our products, so we know that they have it there, and so we don't. We just see the effects of it. You can go into a vitamin shop, and there's so many brands. But there's a lot of other great brands. You could do your research, but that's what we primarily recommend. So just as a follow-up with that, um, if you're on a antidepressant array, do you have if that's something you need to be concerned? With? Do they get a supplement? That's a great question. So I always say ask your physician. Right. Um, I just wanted to, because yeah. I don't think it's something they should just. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, I can clarify. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Always ask your physician if you're on medication first before taking yeah. it. Um, also, benzodiazepine and alkaline, it just it doesn't go. It doesn't work. So yes, please ask your medical professional first. <clears throat> It's on there, it should be on there too. Yeah, yeah. on the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. How do you recommend um, if you feel like you know somebody that may need help? I mean, other than your, yourself, how do you feel is a proper way to approach that person and uh, try to encourage them that some, you know, just talking to you may help or, you know? It depends on the relationship and the person. I personally think that just having that connection that I'm seeing you hurting, and I'm here for you, do you need to talk? And just being not judgmental and allowing someone to just share. And they can be saying things you don't agree with, you don't think it's right. I mean, honestly, one of my number one traits is empathy, but empathy is not sympathy. Empathy means I can read someone's feelings and understand what sadness or anger is. I might not agree why they feel that way, but I can connect with that. So it's just being non judgmental and allowing that space, and then also recommending if you've experienced it yourself, I would connect on that level and kind of share what's helped you. And then maybe just saying, I love that maybe talking to someone would be extremely beneficial for you. But it's just like providing a safe, non judgmental space. I think real quick, I think your comment here about um, 
will this matter one day from now? Is it about in one week or a month? You know, I, in all the years I worked, I never really thought about that. It never came to mind until the last couple of years. And it was, I felt so unfortunate that it took so long for me to realize that. And then as I was leaving with my career, I would talk to people about that. When they have a problem, they come to you and I'd say, but calm down. In 10 years, you're going to be sitting on your front porch rocking in your rocking chair. Who remembers? Who cares? So just, you know, take it easy. And I so wish I had known that in the beginning. I did. Great. Yeah. Unfortunate. Yeah. Because we think feelings are facts and we think they're reality. And the reality is any crisis, any situation you've ever been, seasons of life change. Mm -hmm. And then we think it's never going to change, this is it. And then we get out of it and we're like, so grateful we are. We always have to remember that things don't last forever. It's just a season at a time. You don't even remember. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.